coming? Is it coming? Ah, I think I hear it. <clears throat> so I am nervous, and I'm told that if I start out with a, a joke about Masami, it might make me feel better, but I'm one of the few adults in our church that um, still looks up to Masami, so that's not going to work for me. Uh, so for you... <laughs> So for those of you that, that don't know me, I'm Becky Rootrock. I'm the wife of Scott Rootrock, one of the pastors here on staff, and mother of three energetic kids you may have seen running around here. Hunter is six, going to be seven in just a few days. Caitlin, three, and Gunner, two. Uh, I grew up here in Estacada with my parents and sister, whom is six years older. And I'll start by telling you I didn't grow up in a Christian home. In fact, religion or belief in anything was not something that was discussed in our home. I didn't know what it meant to be a, be a Christian, but on a rare occasion when somebody would ask me what my religion was, I would just say I was a Christian because that was the most common answer I'd ever heard. My exposure to church as a child was minimal. Uh, my, my grandparents did attend a church, so if I were to spend a weekend with them on occasion, I would go. Um, they also prayed before dinner and read their Bible some, ev some evenings, but what I heard them saying and reading was really confusing, and I didn't understand it. I didn't really ask any questions, I just remember quietly listening. Um, my grandparents were the ones that bought me my first Bible, and although I didn't understand much, I had a feeling that there was something really special about this book, and I kept it in its original box still, and I've taken really good care of it. Um, it was in about fifth grade that a friend of mine who consistently attended church, uh, she would invite me to join her family. Uh, because my parents didn't feel comfortable letting me stay overnight, that just never happened. Life seemed pretty good growing up. Unlike many of my friends, my parents were still married. They were also very supportive and involved in things that interested me. Sure, I had a little teenage drama, but I had good grades, was involved in many activities and events at school, was part of the popular crowd, and I kept myself busy with sports. I felt like I had it all under control until around my senior year of high school. An unhealthy relationship, the divorce of my parents, followed by my sister's first divorce, along with disturbing news about a longtime friend and role model, as well as the stress and busyness of my senior year and preparing for college, and all of a sudden, I felt like I was drowning. In the midst of all of this, I just happened to be spending a lot of time with a fellow teammate named Joe. We'd gone to school many years together, but I really not, never got to know him until then. He happened to be good friends with Scott Rootrock, does that name sound familiar? <laughs> so I began spending a lot of time with both Joe and Scott, which were not part of my usual crowd of friends. I really noticed something different about them, though, and I eventually found myself spending more and more time with them over my old friends that were beginning to make some poor choices. They were kind and respectful, as well as fun to be around. I enjoyed my time spent with them without feeling like I was compromising my values. One evening, as Scott and I were attending Joe's basketball game, a few boys sitting behind us began making comments about things that involved me, about things I was not proud of. And I became overwhelmed with feelings of shame and embarrassment, which brought me to my breaking point. Instantly, I got up from the bleachers and calmly walked out of the gym without saying a word to anyone, including Scott. But once I went through that gym door, I ran as quickly as possible down the hall and through the parking lot to my car. I drove around thinking about how terrible things had become and how I couldn't handle these burdens anymore, not on my own. But the thought of sharing what I was going through seemed much too painful. I felt weak and alone and like I had failed. I was used to having control over things and things going as planned. And losing that control, while well, made me feel out of control in a really scary way. Thoughts of ending my life on that drive crossed my mind. This would be the one and only time my mind would go there. But I just couldn't bring myself to do it, and I eventually made my way back home. I wasn't sure what would happen next, but there was Scott waiting in my driveway. He was worried and really confused. He hadn't heard anything said by the boys behind us at the game and was totally lost. Poor guy. He held me while I cried and waited patiently for me to share the garbage I was dealing with. I didn't want to burden him with all this, and I felt terrible for it, but I felt like I owed him some answers at this point. Although it was difficult, it did feel so good to have someone I could trust and share all of this with, someone to listen to, listen to me and not be quick to judge. 
Not long after opening up to Scott in the driveway, he and Joe invited me to the Christmas conference with their youth group, led by Tim and Colleen Schweitzer. I wasn't sure what to expect, but getting out of the house during Christmas break and spending time with my friends sounded great. And hanging out with friends was great, but I also got something I wasn't expecting, a new relationship. And no, it wasn't with Scott. It was a relationship with Jesus. Each speaker's message at that conference, along with the teaching and fellowship of Tim and Colleen, were exactly what I needed. It was really bizarre how it felt like the whole thing was planned just for me and my current struggles. I know it wasn't a coincidence that Scott and Joe came into my life when they did and invited me to this conference. It was all part of God's plan. I came away from that conference feeling like a whole new person, restored and renewed. I was no longer feeling lost and weighed down by the struggles in life. God's forgiveness gave me a sense of worth and a new perspective. I went to the conference feeling so overwhelmed with all that was happening and ashamed of some choices I had made. But God truly took those overwhelming feelings of shame away and allowed me to see true forgiveness. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced. I started attending youth group with Scott and Joe and learning more and more about my amazing God. I found not only my perspective, but also my priorities in life changing little by little. I remember one of my first changes was cutting swear words out of my vocabulary. For some reason, my new friends didn't think it was as cool as my old friends did. As time went on, I found my primary focus in life changing from my career goals and college plans to relationships and not the unhealthy type of relationships I had previously been involved in. Not long after that life-changing Christmas conference, Scott and I started dating, and this also marked the beginning of my detour, of the detour of my lifelong plans. And let me tell you, I had my life all planned out. My primary focus all through school had always been on my career and everything that would lead me to my career as an interior designer. After much research, I was excited to finally make a decision on school and eager to finish my senior year and head to Seattle Pacific University with what turned out to be a substantial scholarship. When Scott and I began dating in January, I didn't think anything about that affecting my long-term plans, probably because I never had a boyfriend for more than two months and college was eight months away. But it wasn't long into a relationship that people started asking me if I'd still be heading to Seattle in the fall. Initially, I found myself casually blowing off the question. I don't know. But then I started wondering that same question myself. Will I be going to Seattle in the fall? I remember feeling like it would be foolish to change my plans just for a relationship, a boyfriend, which in the past had never amounted to anything. But this didn't feel like my other relationships. It was different. I began feeling like my plans didn't line up with God's plans. I wanted to be obedient to God, but that didn't come without feelings of confusion. I remember wondering, what do I do now? What does God want from me? Well, I stayed home for college and soon found my focus shifting from my original plans, interior design, to marriage and having a family. Those thoughts of family and children weren't really something I put much thought into before, and I believe were part of God working in me. Since Scott was still in high school and I knew our plans for marriage and family wouldn't happen for a while, of course I didn't know how long that while would be, I took the time to become a certified professional nanny. Can I mention right now this idea had never crossed my mind before and was never part of my plan. I really never saw it coming. I wanted to start working with, with kids though since I didn't have much experience, being the youngest in my family and I wasn't a babysitter. And although I was excited about this new adventure, sharing my plans with those around me was hard. Quitting college isn't necessarily a popular and exciting idea to some. Not long after I started my first nanny job, I injured my back so badly I was unable to continue working. Once again, another detour. I still knew God was in control, but kept asking, what do I do now, God? My initial back injury was an extremely scary time for me. I was unable to do much for myself, and I fear that might be the case for the rest of my life. Praise be to God, through much prayer and physical therapy, I was able to restore many of my previous abilities, and for that I am so thankful. During my time of recovery, I found a part-time temporary job at an accounting office during tax season. God's hand was most definitely in every detail of me finding and getting this job, which quickly turned into full-time, year-round accounting work for many years to come. 
This was something I never thought about pursuing or planned, but this too, apparently, all part of God's plan. Through all of these twists and turns, God was really teaching me to go with the flow and not be so firm in my plans. I'd always been such a planner, and when things didn't go my way, I fell apart. But I have learned, as it says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, his ways are not our ways. And I am grateful for that. Because over time, I've learned I don't know what is best for myself. And God can use really unusual and unexpected things in amazing ways. Through all of this, he's provided me with someone to stick by my side and remind me to take one day at a time. After six years of dating and waiting and waiting, Scott and I finally got married. And although the years of waiting was a definite test of patience, it was well worth it. And this wouldn't be the only test of patience that God would put me through. When Scott and I decided we were ready to start a family, we were ready. We were surprised when it didn't happen right away. And as the weeks, months, and eventually years passed, I found myself feeling many emotions. Anger, sadness, confusion. Why would it be that God would keep us from having a baby which we wanted so badly when people all over the world were having babies that didn't even want them? Of course, all of my plans at that time revolved around having a family because that is my nature, to plan. So my job, our house, and even our car purchases all revolved around starting a family. Over time, I recognized it was somewhat foolish to keep living our life for kids when kids weren't happening. Scott and I knew we had so much to be thankful for and needed to stop living our lives in a way that revolved completely around starting a family and just enjoy what we had. We eventually had an opportunity to build a new house and decided to go for it, which kept us busy for about a year. It was a beautiful house and exactly what we thought we wanted, but once we settled in, the empty bedrooms became reminders for me of those children we wanted so desperately. Being unable to have children was such a challenging and emotional time, but I knew I wasn't alone and God was there listening the many, many times I cried out to him. Many people in the church prayed for Scott and I and shared stories about their challenges and past experiences, and that was very encouraging. I believe it was through much prayer and eventually some chiropractic visits that God eventually blessed us with our first child, Hunter. And this blessing, although exactly what we wanted, didn't come without added stress and many challenges. Ideally, our desire was for me to be a stay-at-home mom, but with this new, beautiful house, it was necessary for me to continue working part-time, and over time, that just became a burden to myself, as well as the grandmas who provided regular childcare while working full-time themselves. Under normal circumstances, we would have just sold our home and downsized, but with the crashing market, our house had dropped $100,000 in a short time and eliminated that possibility. We pushed forward, struggling financially, while continuing to dream of growing our family. We were uncertain how we would make that dream a reality, and one weekend I remember having a long emotional discussion with Scott about our desire for me to be a stay-at-home mom, our struggle to conceive again, and, our fin and the financial burden of this house we'd built. We knew what we wanted, more kids, and the financial ability to allow me to stay home with them. But again, I asked God, what is your plan for me? What's your plan for us? Would God really want me to quit my job and short sale our house? I just didn't feel right about that and was asking God for direction. When I went to work Monday morning, God spoke loud and clear. When my boss informed me of my layoff after 10 years of employment, Never in my life would I have imagined such a seemingly terrible event feeling like such a blessing. The timing of these events, I felt, were undeniably all God's direct leading. I felt an amazing peace about the whole thing that I could attribute only to God. I knew at that point we would short sell the house, and I would get to stay home with my little boy, and God willing, add to our family. It wasn't without more challenges along the way, but with four within four months of my layoff, I was pregnant with Caitlin. Selling our house turned out to be such a relief. We had spent almost a year of our life putting all we had into building, but the joy of having a family far exceeded anything on this earth. The journey after the short sale didn't come without sacrifices, but the rewards have been great. We had family that was gracious enough to open up their homes for us, and we lived for, with them for the next three years. This allowed us to save money, which we were learning was challenging for a family living on one income. 
Although saving money was one of our main priorities, during this time we wanted to make sure that our relationships wouldn't be hindered for the sake of our financial gain. And living with family, or anyone for that matter, can be difficult because of course we all have different ways of doing things. But so many blessings have come out of these challenging times. The birth of Caitlin, while living with Scott's mom, allowed an opportunity for us to share such an exciting time with her during a challenging time in her life. While living with my mom, we were blessed with Gunner, and as some of you know, that in itself was a major event for the whole family. Although another smooth pregnancy, which in itself was a blessing due to continued back pain over the years, we had no idea what was in store for us with the early arrival of Gunner. With Caitlin and Hunter both being born exactly three weeks before their due date, I was certain one of two things would happen with Gunner. Either he would also be born exactly three weeks early, or maybe because that seemed too predictable, God may use this as another test of patience and make me wait well beyond my due date, which will also go to show that I cannot predict or plan my life as I would like. Well, I of course was wrong in both my predictions when Gunner decided six weeks before my due date that it was time to make his grand entrance into the world. The peace and calmness that God provided for Scott and I, day, Scott and I that day was undeniable. At no point did I ever feel like my life or Gunner's life was in jeopardy. I just knew that God had a plan and was taking care of it all. At a time where many people would have been scared or worried, I felt a peace and calmness that allowed me to focus on the delivery of my baby boy. Since Gunner was early, he did have some short-term complications, and it kept him and I in the NICU for 15 days. Although an incredibly unforeseen and challenging time for our family, so many blessings came for this, from this as well. Scott's employer at the time was flexible with his work, which allowed him to split his time between work and the hospital and also at home with the kids. My mom was able to watch Hunter and Caitlin most of the time, and since we were living in her home, that made it easier for her as well as the kids during a time of chaos. Gifts of prayer and food, child care came pouring in from friends and our church family. And it was so clear to me that God was continuing to lead our family, even during a time that wasn't easy. Without him, I cannot imagine what this experience would have been like. Because I can remember back to when life didn't turn out like I planned. And I can remember how that made me feel. And I can remember how that made me react. And it wasn't good. I think back to that day in high school when I faced my lowest low, when things were too hard to tackle alone. And I went on that drive, and I think about what has changed. It isn't that I don't experience hard times, but the difference is that I'm, I'm not alone. And I understand from experience that he uses these times to teach us, to shape us into who he wants us to be, and to bring about blessings that couldn't occur if things were just always perfect. God has changed my perspective in such a way that I can actually find joy during times that don't seem joyful. I now understand that each part of my life and my experiences are all part of a bigger picture, and sometimes trials are necessary. No, I'm not perfect, and things don't magically work out how I want them to after praying, but he helps me get through tough times, and I sometimes need a reminder that he has a plan. I must tell you, at times I lose sight of these things I've learned. <clears throat> sometimes I get out that yellow pad of paper and plan, plan, plan away, like the old days, instead of consulting with God. At times, I allow myself to get overwhelmed with the tasks of life and forget that God has it all under control. And I've even been known to belt out a swear word while careening down a bank on my bike down a hill that is much too steep for my skill level. But I'm different than I, who I used to be. Ultimately, I've learned that I need to rely on him because I know from the past I can't do it on my own, and only God can see the big picture. <laughs> Lastly, I'll share the journey God took me and my family on with home buying a couple years ago. After living with family for three years, now with three kids, I was eager to have a place to call home. It wasn't long before the excitement of home buying fizzled. As we looked at houses in our price range, I realized that this home purchase wouldn't be the final childhood move we desired for our kids, but just another stepping stone to where we wanted to be. Scott and I were both able to grow up without moving, which we really wanted for our children as well, but so far circumstances had not allowed for that. Sometime during our search, I found a house for sale in Estacada that got me really excited. The size of the home was sufficient for our family, property size was appealing, and the location seemed perfect. Unfortunately, when I connected with a realtor about this property, it already had a buyer. At one point, we ended up making an offer on a townhouse without much of a yard, and even though it didn't seem like a great fit for our family, 
I still felt disappointed when our offer wasn't accepted. But even through times of disappointment, I knew God would take care of us and was excited for him to reveal his plan. After looking through a few not-so-desirable houses in not-so-desirable locations and being somewhat discouraged, Scott ended up finding property to build on. The property size was great, but the location wasn't. We reluctantly moved forward with this building possibility, constantly asking God if this was his plan all along the way. We felt really uncertain, but decided we would move forward, forward until we found him clearly shutting the door on this opportunity. At this point, we hadn't found any other possibilities, and this appeared to be the best thing out there for us. We were quite aware that our circumstances were different than our previous buying and building, and were prepared to make big sacrifices. All along the way, I remember continually saying that I know God has a plan for us in all this, and I'm just so excited to see what that is, because I knew it would be better than anything I could ever imagine. I would never have anticipated what God would do next and the opportunity that he would set before us. One evening, as Scott and I continued to question our plan to build in a not-so-desirable location, and within hours of losing earnest money on our current plan, I received a text from Alyssa Cole, formerly known as Alyssa Waxenfelter, asking if we might be interested in buying her mom's house. The loss of Grady would lead Tedra to build a new house, and she desired to sell to someone she knew to keep it in the family, the church family, that is. Of course, that night, we didn't know if all the details would really work out for us to purchase the home, but we felt that this was God at least telling us, do not move forward on those building plans. Just wait. For those of you that don't know, Don and Alice Schweitzer had this house built many years ago, and it's where they raised their family and eventually sold it to the Waxenfelters. So it's been in the church family all along. And I must take this time to make the connection for those of you that haven't already done it. Um, so Don and Alice Schweitzer, their son Tim Schweitzer, which is my youth pastor when I first started going to church. So I just thought that was really cool, all the, the connections that God has made throughout the years. Once again, the timing of the events made it clear to us that God's hand was in this. On top of it all, the house I had found towards the beginning of our search and got so excited about happened to be right next door to the Waxenfelter's house. A similar floor plan, property, layout, size, and of course, the same great location. Through many obstacles, this did become our home, and it turns out is exactly one mile from the church, which is where Scott now works full time. This home is way more than we could have ever imagined God would provide for us. But when I look back, it's exactly what we wanted. This isn't a place we reluctantly settled for, and it's another reminder that through tragedy, God can provide blessings. One thing I've learned through my journey is only God knows how this story will turn out. I know he is in complete control, so I will continue to sit in the passenger seat and allow him to lead me through this life and keep sharing with others as he does. Thank you so much for your time. That's an amazing story. I was riveted. Thank you, Becky, for sharing. God is good, isn't he? All the time. And we just see that in her story and so many stories that the goodness of God is manifest through all those dark times and then bringing blessing even out of those dark times. We serve an amazing God. We serve an amazing God that has done everything that we need done for us to not just have a relationship with him, but then to change and grow. I just want you to notice that when we have these redemption stories shared, that they don't just stop when there's that point of, quote, salvation. That's just the beginning point, isn't it? And we saw in Becky's life as a high schooler that change that came and then all of a sudden, all these change of attitudes and change of perspectives and change of goals, all those changes that come. Because what I want us to understand as we approach our communion today is that what God desires for us and what he's accomplished through the sending of his son, through the body that was laid out for us for the from the blood that was shed for us, was not just a point of salvation, not just the granting of forgiveness, but then all that comes after that, 
That's always been the goal, to, to call a people to be his, to change a people. And I think sometimes we kind of, uh, to reflect on Becky's story, short sell the gospel. That it's just about, I need forgiveness. And granted, we all have needed forgiveness, amen? But what we need is forgiveness and then a change, a new life, a new perspective. And all of that comes through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. For the last number of months, I've been leading a Bible study over at Whispering Pines through the book of Hebrews, a book that I hope we can jump into as a church family here in the fall. The repeated message of the book of Hebrews is the superiority and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ in comparison to all the Old Testament that he is enough. And it's like the writer of Hebrews hits the nail over and over and over again. He is enough. So a couple weeks ago as we approached the end of Hebrews, there's a statement that's made that just captures all that Jesus Christ did. I want to put it on the screen and I want us to read it together and then just share a little bit So we understand as we share communion together today the fullness that we have in what Jesus Christ has done. I'm going to ask you to stand together with me right now. We're going to read this screen and the next one. Read it with me. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Next slide. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. Then he says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Thank you. You may be seated. We need to understand that when Jesus Christ came, which was the eternal plan of God to not just provide our forgiveness, he came to provide new life. And what you see in the capital letters there is actually an Old Testament reference that the writer of Hebrews makes. And I want you to notice that When the Old Testament writes about this Messiah that is going to come, they don't just write about this forgiveness that is going to be granted through the Messiah, but also the newness that is going to come. So you notice in that text there, it says, I will write my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. In other words, there's going to be something new inside of people that happens when this Messiah comes. And then it says in verse 17, and yes, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's the forgiveness part. And I think oftentimes we just camp on this fact that I've been forgiven. And that's huge, amen? We need that. We're desperately in need of forgiveness. But to understand the fullness of it, that forgiveness then allows this newness to come, this transformation the law then to be on our hearts and in our minds and in Becky's story and all these redemption stories we hear, we hear the same thing. That when that forgiveness came, it brought something new, a new way to think, a new way to feel, new goals, new desires, new passions that are brand new because we become brand new. If we go back one slide, when I was working with uh, our Bible study, I asked them, so we've been hearing about all that Jesus Christ did on the cross and how that's superior to everything in the Old Testament, all the Old Testament sacrifices, but what did it all do for us? 
And they kept saying, well, it gives us forgiveness. Okay, that's good. It gives us eternal life. It, that's good. It gives us uh, f- freedom from this sin, and that's good. Then I asked the question, did it make you perfect? And they all said, oh, no, it didn't make us perfect. Well, then I said, well, what's this verse 14 all about? Because what's it say? For by one offering, read it with me, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified or those who are set apart. You know, when I asked that question, did it make you perfect, all of them thought, as even we would, no, I still sin, I I still don't do things right all the time. And that really wasn't my question. My point, it says, did it make you perfect in the sight of God? And indeed, that's what it has done. When we are forgiven, we're not just forgiven. There's this beautiful truth that the very righteousness of Christ is given to us. So that that moment of salvation, the moment the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is applied to us, at that moment, we're not just forgiven. We are declared, and the very, we're declared righteous, and the very righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. So that when God looks at us, we are seen as what? Perfect. Get that now. Perfect. Now, all of us are in this process of living out that perfection and growing in that perfection. But from God's perspective right now, we are seen as absolutely perfect. So the writer of Hebrews says, by that one offering, the offering of Jesus Christ, he has perfected all of those that have been set apart to him. He's done it. It's a done deal. See, even though Becky still cusses every once in a while, She's perfected, amen? In the sight of God, she is perfect, regardless of what happens next. And we miss that truth, I think, church. As we come to the communion table, don't just think of it, well, this is why, this is how I'm forgiven. No, this is how I'm perfected because of what he's done for me. I'm perfected. It's interesting, we don't see it necessarily in the English, but in the Greek language, There's a tense in the Greek language in verbs that I just love. It's called the the perfect tense. It means it's something that was accomplished in the past that then continues as a state of being. So in the past, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he perfected us and issued us into this state of perfection. Don't you just love that truth? Now we'll go out here today and Maybe even while we're sitting here, we'll have thoughts that are wrong, we'll sin, but that, does never, that never changes the state of perfection that we stand in the presence of God because of Jesus Christ. And when we come to the communion table, that's just another reason to say, thank you, God, for making me perfect in the sight of an eternal and just God. Now, if we go a couple slides forward, Laura, I had to go back, and now we're going to go two forward here. I just want to show you how this is stated in a few other places. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then, he, then as I'm looking at this, here's what it means to be reconciled, or here how this happens. He made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. So our sin was dumped onto Jesus so that, read it with me, we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you see it there? All of our sin was dumped on Jesus Christ, and then all of his righteousness was what? Dumped onto or into us. So now we are the righteousness of God because of Jesus Christ. We are righteous because of Jesus Christ. And so when we speak of reconciliation with God, understand we are not, understand this, we are not reconciled to God just because we're forgiven. We are reconciled to God because we've been forgiven and then given his righteousness. We cannot enter into heaven just because we're forgiven. 
We can enter into heaven because we've been forgiven and we've been made righteous. That's why there's eternal life in the presence of God. Let me show it to you again. Next slide. Romans 5, 18. For as through one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, that's all of us, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will what? Be made righteous. Notice it doesn't say through the obedience of the one, the many are forgiven, which is true, but the writer of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, is emphasizing you're not just forgiven. Adam's sin brought all of us to be sinners by very nature, but now in Christ we're not just forgiven. Our very nature is changed, so now we are righteous. Let me show it to you one more time. Next slide. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is forgiven. That's obviously not what it says. While it's true, if we're in Christ, we're forgiven. Amen? But notice again what the Apostle Paul says. If any man is in Christ, he's a what? New creature. In other words, brand new, a new nature, a new passion, a new desire, a new vision, new goals. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So we are here today, and the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ have made us new creations, not what we used to be. And again, these redemption stories highlight that, don't they? You know, if, if it was just about forgiveness, as soon as Becky said, yeah, at this winter youth celebration, I found Christ as my Savior, I'd say, okay, end of story. But notice her story went on. And this new creation that she became and what that brought into her life. So church, understand the fullness of what he has accomplished. Understand the fullness that he wants us to remember even now. Understand that it's not just forgiveness that we're granted. It's not just our sin placed on Jesus it's his very righteousness given to us, and we stand in that today. So in a moment as we share communion, reflect on that. And when you thank him, which we ought to, as we, as we thank him for this sacrifice again, thank him for the fullness of it. Not just your forgiveness, but this newness that has come with the desire that you can continue to walk. If you're new with us, the way we share a communion is maybe just a little bit different. Our musicians will come up, and they'll play three songs, and during that time, it's time for us to just thank God as we sing, to, to remember Jesus Christ and what he has done, to celebrate it, and to prepare ourselves then to come and take the elements. So anytime during those three songs, you can come, you can hopefully come with those that are with you there, Spend time in prayer together. You can go into the fireside room. You can go in the foyer. You can sit right where you're at, whatever you'd like to do. But it's a time to remember the fullness of what he has done for us. If you're with us today, and all that, that I've said doesn't make any sense to you, you're probably not a follower of Jesus. You're probably not a believer. And frankly, this, this is not for you. Because this is for those of us who have followed Jesus to remember all that he's done for us. But it's my prayer that even as we sing, that God would convince you that you need Jesus Christ and call out to him and do so. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you again for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you continue to do. Thank you, Jesus, that the work that you accomplished on the cross is, is still working. It's still working to change us, to grow us, to to empower us. It's, it's this work, Jesus, that even now is calling people into a relationship, into newness of life. So we just say thank you, Father. We want to spend this time as we worship in Jesus, as we remember you, to just say thank you over and over again in our hearts. 
and to truly honor you for all that you've done for us. So lead us and guide us, Lord. Do your work by your Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's areas of our lives that, that we just need to open up to you again, if we've, if we've built walls that, that we're kind of keeping things we think from you, Lord, we just open that up to you again. Grow us. Change us. Jesus, make us more like you, even as we remember you today. Thank you.